When I was a young child, my mother was a real stickler on manners. Perhaps your mom was too. She wouldn't acknowledge our request if they didn't come with a please. And then we would often wait in some sort of exaggerated still life pose until we replied, thank you. So you know, she gave us a muffin. We said, please give us a muffin. She gave us a muffin, and then she waited. Uh, 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 until we said thank you. This went on all the time. I mean, you'd think as little kids we would have figured it out. Soon. But we didn't. Uh, but that is what today's gospel is all about, right? Right? Today's gospel? About thanks and no thanks and thank you and polite manners from Mrs. Ross. Well, then I guess we're done. Thanks for coming. <laughs> Wait a minute. You saw the attendees. Probably you're saying to yourself, Luke. Gospel of Luke, it's never that easy with Luke. Luke always makes it hard. On purpose, I think. Jesus heals ten lepers, but only one had a mother like mine and came back to say, Thank you. That must be the true message of the Gospel from Luke today. Blessed are those who thank people. Thank people if they heal them. Well, the truth is, the gospel surely must go deeper than that. Jesus was walking near Samaria. People from Samaria were called Samaritans, as you would assume. You know, you know the Samaritans, they have the signs up on the bridges, you know, feeling down, call the Samaritans, they're anti-suicide hotline. Uh, but, but in this case, it was just the opposite. The Samaritans were reviled. They were the lowest of the low. You know, if you wanted to find an analog for vicious terrorists, it would be Samaritan. So that's what we're up against. That, that's who's coming back to say thank you to Jesus. Jesus does not pronounce any words of healing to the ten, except to tell them and go and present themselves to the temple priest, presumably in Jerusalem. As the lepers hurried away, they were healed. Then one of them, a Samaritan, turned back to give thanks. Jesus seems myth that only 10% of those who were healed returned to give thanks only the reviled Samaritan. Does this gospel mean to imply that the nine healed lepers were not appreciative? Well, we can't be sure of that based on what the gospel has told us. There's just not enough information. What we do know is that it was an ancient Jewish tradition, if you experienced any kind of healing, to go to the temple and show the rabbi. We can also imagine that Jesus wanted the religious authorities to know of his work of healing. What better way than to have ten le healed lepers at your door? But what is the true purpose of the gospel? What is the essence of this story of Jesus from Luke? We may have a hint of that in the early part of the gospel. Did you notice that there aren't any specific pronouncements from Jesus regarding the healing like there are in other gospel miracle stories? Did you notice that? In many healing stories, Jesus does an action or some kind of uh, effect that, that determines the healing. There's no, remember you put the mud together and you put the muddy dirt on the eyes? There's none of that. Uh, there's no Lazarus come out, famous story of Jesus' friend being risen from the dead. But in this case, Jesus simply tells them to go and show themselves to the priests. As they went, they were made clean. Hmm. Some scholars of the Bible say the world has been unfair to the nine ungrateful lepers. After all, one scholar wrote, they were only doing what Jesus told them to do. Isn't that right? Jesus said, go present yourselves to the priests. And they were doing that. So where does that leave us? We have nine healed people who go on and one who comes back. Two groups of people, each reacting differently. Could it be that there was two different kinds of healing? Hmm. Could it be that Jesus healed the bodies of the nine, but healed the body and the soul of the one who came back? Could it be that Jesus healed nine physically and one spiritually? Those are the kind of questions we have to ask about today's gospel. The sermon today, if I were to describe it, is all about health. Certain kinds of health that are in the news a lot these days. Each presidential candidate promising to do something more and greater about our health care. But today I want to preach about two kinds of health, physical health and spiritual health. When I was serving God in Austinville, Massachusetts, down in Cape Cod, it was my first rectorship, 
I met a wonderful woman whom I'll call Jan. That was not her real name. Jan was so full of life that when she entered a room, it just lit up just from her smile. Jan was the ultimate glasses half full kind of person. If she discovered that the bread in her house went stale, she'd say, now how did God know I was making toast today? Virtually every encounter I had with her was a joyous celebration of life. One day I ran into her son at the supermarket and I told him one more wonderful Jan story. Her son paused for a moment and asked, has mom told you about her illness? Illness? What illness? I, I, I asked. Stammering, he told me how she was diagnosed with lymphoma, an often fatal cancer of the blood. I was stunned. Jan sick? Impossible. Her son assured me that they had the test done and another test done, all up and down the East Coast, and each diagnosis was the same. Is there anything I can do, I asked, feeling quite inadequate at the time. Well, said her son, you could pray for her and continue being her good friend. She likes you. He said, I, I told him how much I adored his mother, and, and of course I said I would do all I could, and, and more, I hope. He said, well, speaking of more, <coughs> could you help us convince her to go get her chemo treatments? Of course, I, I'll, I'll do that, I assured him. Just a few days later, I ran into Jan, and I told her that I had just learned about her illness. She was surprised that it had take the, taken the grapevine that long <laughs> for it to reach me. You know how in a church grape life, grapevine happens a little quicker sometimes. Uh, the topic of treatment came up, and I used it to advocate for her treatment. Chemo, she said. It'll ruin my summer. I have gardens to plant and places to go. I'll get the medicine in the fall. And sure enough, Jan skipped the treatments and went out and lived a rich, full life as a gardener. All summer long, sometimes right after Labor Day, I ran into her and reminded her of her promise to me to get her medicine in the fall. She said, oh, Rob, I had my blood work done the other day, and my blood count is way up, and that's good. I think summer was my best medicine. My friend Jan had spiritual health. What she lacked in physical health, she more than made up for in spiritual health. Please don't consider the sermon an advocating or ignoring your doctor's orders. That's not what I'm trying to say at all. Don't ever do that. It is not. But I do remember often saying to people, I'd sure hate to be the cancer that found itself trapped inside Jan's body during the summer. It didn't stand a chance. Her attitude, her approach to life, her joy at all of God's creation, it was all very inspiring. But in Jesus' Gospel from Luke, he is giving us the picture of Jan in the person of the thankful leper. Jesus is surely not calling us to choose between physical and spiritual health. God would certainly want us to have both. But I do believe that Jesus is using this story of the lepers to remind us that one is superior over the other. The cleansed leper who returned to give thanks to Jesus was both physically as well as spiritually healed. When I left Massachusetts to move to the Bay Area, Jan was at the height of her powers. I thought she'd outlive me by 10 years. But then the phone rang one day when I was in California, and in the second winter we were there, it was her son calling to tell me that Jan had died. I was first shocked and then deeply saddened to lose such a wonderful friend. Her son's last words to me were, Heaven will never be the same. <laughs> At the memorial service held that summer, of course, I was honored to deliver the eulogy to a good friend. All I could do was to think of the wonderful tale, the wonderful descriptor from Shakespeare's A Winter's Tale. Uh, I'm paraphrasing now. Her heart. There was no winter in it. Jan and the leper and this gospel this morning are like beacons in the night. They are the lighthouses for our souls. May there be no winter in your healthy heart and soul. May your spirit soar like the spirit of the grateful leper and soar like my friend Jim. Amen. <laughs>